Gatwick Airport, London. I flew in from Greece six hours ago and I'm about to experience a totally different climate and scenery. It's 9.15 at night and I'm heading for another adventure in majestic Norway. Destination Bergen on the west coast. We arrive as the sun sets at 11 p.m. I'll soon be sailing through these islands. And Guna has planned another amazing trip. The Comfort Hotel at the airport certainly lived up to its name. A five minute walk across the road, I was in bed 30 minutes after we landed. The Comfort Hotel was excellent. It cost $100, comparable to London Airport, and cheaper than the Comfort Inn at New York LaGuardia, including a great breakfast and excellent service. The lamp stand was novel. You can buy one online for about $6,000. The design and decor, incredible. Comfort in style. I found the design refreshing and interesting. The courtyard was fascinating. It's worth a visit just to see the place. Yes, this is the courtyard of the hotel and the murals about 20 feet high. Takes Banksy to a new level. The message don't let yourself be intimidated by the ugliness of the world. Environmentally friendly. Great room, now slept in. Modern design. And next morning I took the five minute walk back to the airport as I contemplated another look at Bergen. And got a ticket for the light rail train that takes 45 minutes to the center of Bergen for $5 if you buy a ticket from the machine or $7.50 if you buy it on the train. Seniors and children, half price. You have to love this place. Clean, quiet, uncrowded, efficient, and aesthetic. A train winding its way down a road reminded me of Darjeeling in India. This is the train ride into town from the airport. I was very impressed by the light rail train. Now I need to stroll to the harbour pushing my suitcase and getting my shots. Very happy that the weather was behaving. Last time I did this, it was raining. My trusty iPhone directing my path and telling me it's seven minutes to the harbour.
Bergen is an average of 231 rainy days a year, so I'm super happy. It looks beautiful in the sunshine. The Norled terminal is about a hundred yards up the quay. It's an interesting walk, with cruise ships and yachts resplendent and certainly a very happy crowd of tourists enjoying it all. Across the harbour, the iconic Brigham. And here is the express boat that will take me up the coast to Selya in five hours. I was two hours early and had to find a locker for my bags. When I inquired at the boat, the crew member immediately smiled and told me he'd put them on the boat for me. A quick check of the ticket to make sure I was indeed on the right boat and then off I went, free as a bird, only camera in hand to shoot Sunny Bergen. This is gonna be fun. It's my third visit to Bergen, and knowledge and experience have taught me when in Bergen, pray hard for sunshine. Every now and then it happens, and this impressive city takes on a different persona. People enjoying lunch in the open air, the sky almost devoid of clouds, the magnificent buildings looking like they're enjoying the day as they look over the harbour with smiling faces. It's Saturday morning and the tourists have been joined by the locals enjoying the occasion. Mouth-watering sights abound. Fish, lobster, crab and shrimps tempting the palate. Shrimps here, $40 a kilo, about three times the price of the supermarket. Spider crabs a delicacy. Spanish paella, delicious. Or fish cooked to your liking, not a problem. Or try the nearby restaurant and eat in comfort, overlooking memorable views. Even take a boat trip around the harbour on the hop-on, hop-off water bus for $12. Believe me, there's much to see. In the distance, the historic, iconic Brigham. The harbour in Bergen is really well sheltered. It's about a kilometre long and less than 200 metres wide. It's a joy to stroll around, admire the view, soak in the history and perhaps have a meal.
The Brigham has been on the UNESCO list of World Cultural Heritage Sites since 1979 and is easily recognizable. It's one of the oldest trading ports in Northern Europe. The problem being that it's made of wood and it's suffered many fires over the years. The narrow harbour means vessels are moored four deep, sometimes even more. But what a great place for a drink on top of the boat. The express boat leaves at 2.15 and it's 1.15, so I'm already wishing I had more time here. Having said that, I'm about to cruise up the west coast on such a day as this, so I'm very happy. This vessel caught everyone's eye. Majestic, imposing. It's a three-masted bark-rigged vessel that I would have loved to see in sail. After the First World War, the ship was taken as a prize by the United Kingdom. And in recent times, it's been used as a school ship for the Royal Norwegian Navy. If you take the $12 water bus, you can get a close-up view. Forty-five minutes before I sail? What to do? I've checked the funicular railway to see the view over Bergen, but the queue was too long. So I decided I'd see the old houses of the Brigham and the old part of town. Right behind the gabled frontage of iconic buildings, one finds some fascinating sights. St. Mary's Church, Maria Kirken. The oldest building in Bergen, built in the first half of the 12th century and one of the most outstanding Romanesque churches in the country. This part of Bergen was a thriving port in the 1700s, selling mainly dried codfish. Wooden houses with narrow alleys still survive from those days. It has burned down several times and had to be rebuilt. Strolling through the place helps the visitor appreciate a little of what it was like. Plenty of places to explore here. Museums, even shopping. I still have 25 minutes before the boat leaves. A leisurely stroll enjoying the sunshine and the sights feels like a good idea. It's clearly one of those lazy, hazy, crazy days of summer. 
Couldn't make it up the hill, but I did get a good shot from down here. The Sony AX100 camera is great for these shots. This shot is handheld. I'm about five minutes from the boat, which leaves in 15 minutes. So a few last shots. Today the amazing scenery of Norway has had to give way to city shots. The busy waterfront with a multitude of yachts. People enjoying the day. The gabled brigand, the splendid harbour. But the boat beckons. They remembered me, so I didn't even need to show my ticket again. I immediately went to the front of the boat to shoot the panorama. I still remember standing here, enjoying another wow moment in Norway. Not driving through a valley or sailing through a fjord, rather in the heart of one of Norway's most loved and cherished cities. And the best weather. What a feeling. I've taken this trip once before, in 2017, having caught the train from Oslo to Bergen on that occasion great train ride, my film Inspiring Norway tells the story, but I'd been disappointed by the weather, it had been cloudy and rainy. Today my prayers were answered, and we sailed out of Bergen Harbour with perfect weather, ready to enjoy what has to be one of the best boat trips on the planet. Through narrow sounds, under the bridges, past innumerable islands, and with beautiful scenery all the way. My joy was thus enhanced, I knew what to expect. The captain had informed me that it was possible for passengers to go out on the front of the boat allowing me to get some spectacular shots as the trip progressed. As we sailed out of the splendid harbour, I was quickly reminded that I was in one of the most scenic places on earth. The magnificent harbour populated today with a grand assortment of vessels from small fishing boats to ocean-going liners. Such is the attraction of it that as I strolled around the town earlier, people just sat and observed it, like a version of people watching, watching the goings-on in the harbour. Imagination is a wonderful pastime. It ignites passion, maps out our futures, and kickstarts our planning. And most of all, it lifts my mood. Where are you going to? So many vessels, so many destinations. I love airports, looking at the departure board and seeing all the exotic destinations and wishing I was not meeting somebody, but going somewhere. So what about this trip? I'd taken the same trip before as far as Molay, 
With the weather behaving itself, I was determined to make the best of it, and so I did. Norway is a land of spectacular scenery, which I usually view from Gunas Kar. Today, a different perspective, cruising through the islands. This is not a river, it's a sound. The channel here is between two islands, and because the islands are close together, we get great views of the shores. Naturally, from time to time, bridges span the sounds. Having said that, in many places, it does feel like the boat is on a river thus providing a great variety of fascinating viewpoints. and scenery that can suddenly change as the boat emerges from a sound and then quickly enters another. The proximity to land allowing us to share fun family moments. With a coastline that's over 3,000 miles longer than that of the USA, we can understand why it's said that everyone in Norway either owns a boat or know somebody who has one. As the trip progresses, this is clearly evident. First stop, 50 minutes to here, right on time. As we progress, I begin to realize that this boat is a very important means of transportation for the people in these places. As a tourist, I'm blown away by the scenery, but the main purpose of the boat is to ferry people between remote places. Having said that, it's a very enjoyable way to go. Some may say it's slow, but it's actually the quickest way unless you have a helicopter. The kids playing in the sea. We're two hours into the journey, so I went downstairs and bought a snack. Few restaurants have views like these. The front of the boat was great for video, but a little breezy. Some of these waters can be very dangerous in rough weather. Earlier this year, a cruise ship had to be helped into port by the Norwegian Coast Guard. And believe it or not, a tunnel is planned. The Stard Ship Tunnel that cuts through the Stard Peninsula and will be so large it can accommodate ships up to 16,000 tons. Though it won't be able to accommodate the larger cruise ships. To put it into perspective, the smallest Norwegian cruise line ship at present is 77,000 tons, five times larger than the tunnel can manage, though the local Hootigruten ships are small enough to pass. The Stard Peninsula 
is actually where we're heading. The express boat stops at Selya. The tunnel will be here, thus avoiding the trip around the peninsula. The five-hour trip is a great experience, giving visitors the opportunity to view the amazing beauty of Norway from a different perspective. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Five hours in a car can be taxing, but on the boat I was able to walk around, have a drink or snack, go outside and even chat with people. The boat itself was impressive. We arrived right on time, the staff were excellent, the ride comfortable, and the opportunity to travel up the beautiful coast in this way, a must for any visitor to Norway. On reaching Molly, it brought back memories of 2017 when we visited Kalvog. I still think Inspiring Norway is one of my best films. Finally, we arrived at Selje. And there was Guna, and the motorhome he'd hired. A great trip. Now time to explore another part of Norway. Would you like to go swimming? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's very, very warm. It's always good to see Guna. We met when he was working in Hong Kong and his kids are still my kids' oldest friends. Gunnar is a Norgophile, as I am, and he's never happier than when he's introducing aspects of Norway that I've never seen. So I arrive at a remote peninsula as far north as Iceland, and there's a beach. The people having fun by the seaside. These are not beach huts, they're boat houses. This is Norwegian seaside resort. It's really good except uh, the water's a, a cool 15 degrees. We're soon on our way. Destination Vestcap, 32 kilometers away. Our route takes us through the mountains and then along the coast. Norway never ceases to amaze me. The juxtapositioning of sky, sea and mountains creating majestic scenery. The express boat I just took came in through this inlet. We made our way to the other side of the peninsula 
and then drove up the side of the fjord, enjoying the great views. One of the joys of the Norwegian summer is the sunset. It literally takes the sun three hours to set. In Hong Kong, it's gone in 10 minutes. The views here are generally from above and across water and often with some clouds. Makes sunsets very interesting. First stop is the church at Ervik, which is right on the bay. Bathed in the evening sun. Then the climb up to Vest Cap. Vest Cap English West Cape is described as Norway's westernmost viewpoint on the mainland. It's at an elevation of 497 meters above sea level. On clear days, we have a marvelous panoramic view in all directions. 360 degrees. It's 12 o'clock at night and uh, the sun just setting. And we're parked for the night, right on top. This is our view for both dinner and breakfast. The views really are 360 degrees here the Sunmoor Alps in the distance, the wild Stadhaven Ocean. For me it's been an amazing day. I woke up in Bergen And Guna has a great day planned for tomorrow. When I opened my eyes this morning, this was the scene with which I was confronted. Cloud-kissed, snow-clad mountains, verdant meadows, glassy fjords. What a place to wake up. The good news is that we were about to eat breakfast in this delightful setting. The motorhome enabling us to get a great start to the day. got some kippers for breakfast and quite an assortment here. Well, unfortunately, getting a bit of rain this morning. We're making our way to Nordfjordeid, 
and the newly opened Sagerstad Viking Museum that features a full-size reconstruction of a Viking ship that was discovered there. The 85-kilometer journey will take about an hour and 20 minutes, but most of it is along the shores of the fjords. Even in the rain, Norwegian countryside is majestic, the languid lakes bringing the countryside to life. The finger of the fjord reaching many miles inland. Our plan on reaching Eid is to have a quick snack and then take a look at the museum. At least it's indoors and we won't be affected by the rain. The Sagerstad Viking Museum was created in May 2019 and contains a reconstruction of the Mikkelbust, a large Viking ship found in 1874 in a burial mound nearby. The visitor is invited to enter the Viking Age and to follow a chieftain on his last journey to the grave and the afterlife. Nordfjord Eid is right at the heart of the fjords and holds an important place in Norway's history. The museum being close to the burial mound in which the ship was discovered. The mound is 30 meters in diameter and 4 meters tall and originally had a broad moat. It dates back 1200 years and is thought by some to be the burial mound of King Audbjorn, who was killed in the Battle of Sulchel, that is described in the Old Norse Sagas. It really is a fascinating story. When the remains of the burned Viking ship were found, only the nails were intact. But the number and position of the nails indicated the ship would have been over 25 meters long. That's over 82 feet, making it the largest Viking ship that's ever been found in Norway. The mound also contained a number of interesting objects dating from the end of the 9th century, giving some indications of the mystical rituals performed during the burial ceremony. The museum recreating scenes from history to illustrate bygone culture. All in all, it provides great insight into the way of life in the Norse society of the day. The design was remarkable. The reflections of the grass and sky outside bringing natural light, color and shapes into the building. There are even some interactive exhibits. Well, keep pressing. You know. Whatever you want. From uh, Ireland. Guna clearly well informed. A special presentation depicts the burning of King Albion's ship, part of an elaborate rite of passage to the next world. They believed he would be led by the Valkyries to Valhalla, the Hall of the Slain, ruled over by the god Odin. Valkyrie means chooser of the slain. In Norse mythology, a Valkyrie was a mythical female who chose those who may die in battle and those who may live. The Valkyrie selected half of those who die in battle, the other half go to the goddess Freya's afterlife field. 
in the autumn of 2016, it was decided to build this remarkable full-scale replica of the ship. Skilled boat builders from Björkedalen reconstructed the Mikkelbust ship the way it would have looked over a thousand years ago. Gunnar actually knew some of the people who worked on the ship. Björkedalen is only a few miles from Volda where Gunnar lives. Their creation is certainly very impressive, great attention paid to detail, and the skills and methods of the original builders were employed by the skill artisans of today. Forty-eight shields protected the oarsmen seated on stools. A ramp enables visitors to actually walk on the ship and explore the individual parts. Even the oars have been replicated. It was a massive undertaking and provides us with a unique opportunity to experience what it was like in this spectacular environment. It actually had a mast and sail, this being where it would have been placed. The museum was excellent, giving great insight into Viking history with superb presentations. We really enjoyed it, a must visit place. After our enjoyable interlude at the Viking Ship Museum, we're heading east through the heart of Norway and some amazing scenery. The sun, however, is taking a rest. Though it's the middle of summer, the mountains retain their snow caps. Our destination is Strin Summerski, a summer ski resort in the mountains that's even open in June. It's a 90 minute drive through Norway's mountains and valleys. As usual, there are the iconic waterfalls that are nothing short of spectacular. Descending hundreds of feet they're powerful, one might even say significant. We can clearly see why it's called majestic. Our route today is through the wild raw spaces of Norway. I'm glad I have the drone to capture different facets of this imposing creation, where waterfalls create dynamic music and mountains form the setting.
It goes without saying that the camera cannot capture the way one feels being here in the midst of it all. It's indeed a spiritual experience that words cannot describe, that feeds both the spirit and the soul. The next part of the journey was one of intensity. Looking out the window was an experience. The sound of wind and water, the sights of snow and cloud, with no break in the spectacle. Every now and then we stop to take it all in. I want to communicate the moment, but even with music and words I can't do it justice. The experience, definitely subjective, we all perceive it differently. All this on a dull day, occasionally catching sight of the blue sky. Then the ski lift comes into view, but skiing stops at 4 p.m. Snow all around. lake, partly frozen. Well, temperature Pretty low right now, snow all around, and a little blue sky emerged. About two feet of snow at the side of the road, and an interesting sky reflecting off the lake, actually creating some beautiful views. We're at 1,139 meters above the sea level.
We're actually continuing east, but we'll soon turn north and then west to park on Lake Bridalsvetnet for the night. The road is certainly one of the most scenic rides I've driven in Norway. This is raw, rugged, remote Norway. Even the road is not paved, really off the beaten track. A rainbow illuminating the mountains. We're looking for a place to park for the night. Now this should look good in the morning. Next morning we woke up to a fantastic view, beautiful weather, bird song, snow-capped mountains, one of those very special places on planet earth. This is where we parked the motorhome for the night and ate breakfast enjoying the solitude of nature. What an amazing location it was. In the midst of this unspoilt paradise, The lake so calm it reflected the sky. Guna had carefully looked at the map and noticed a small road leading right up to the edge of the lake. He found it and we parked there. Oh, 
This is fantastic. Oh, I have that good to be alive feeling. I've called this film Majestic Norway and there's no denying it's the right title. The scenery is often breathtaking and yet we're seeing about one millionth of it. Were I to explain the beauty of Norway, I should probably describe it as no doubt I have already in other films, as the juxtapositioning of mountains, fjords and sky. I suppose the snow is the icing on the cake. Even in June, it's not unusual to see frozen or partly frozen lakes. It's not that the mountains are high. They are not particularly high. It's the fact that Norway is as far north as the Far East is east. It was a delight to travel through the pristine countryside. Our first destination is Dal Snipper, which is only about half an hour away. It's an area we've been very close to many times, but this is my first visit. You want a glimpse of Norwegian countryside in June? And spoilt raw nature. Up and up we go, because when we reach the summit, we'll be on top of the world looking down on creation. The Osmo Pocket doing a great job. Soon the Geiranger Skywalk at Dalsnipper is in sight. The view took my breath away. Majestic Norway. Above Geiranger Fjord, a mini troll ladder. We'll soon follow that road to the legendary Troll Stegen. The cruise ships surrounded by nature. What views they get from there. As we survey the scene, it's a spiritual moment. A masterpiece of God. Certainly awe-inspiring. They've really done a great job of the lookout. Even children can safely stand in awe.
We're really on top of the world here. Visitors just sit and wonder. Steep, long and winding roads pave the way for others to come and see. Standing at the top, I find myself shooting the same shot ten different ways, not wanting to miss an opportunity to record it for posterity. Such is the sight. Seems I'm not alone in the quest. When cruise ships dock in Gairanga, they run bus trips to various places, and I did notice tour buses here. No wonder. There's something about places like this that takes the human soul to a different level. Almost an out-of-body experience, as though my feet aren't touching the ground. I feel my spirit soar my mind embrace another facet of life. I wonder if they all feel it. Certainly Gunnar is enjoying the moment. We then enjoyed a lighter moment with the troll. This is a shot of Guna and the troll. On the right is uh, Guna, and uh, down below is uh, But it's time to move on. Back to the vehicle. What an experience it's been. Guna really excelled this time. So our brief sojourn at the top of the world comes to an end. We're heading toward the renowned Gairanga Fjord that we've just viewed from a height and stop for one last look. Majestic. The lookout at Dalsnipa, right at the summit of the mountain. Well, there's uh, a lot of snow up here. And, uh, you know, the thing I always want to do here, make a snowball. This place is really fantastic, and uh, just looking around and seeing everything is wonderful. Gairanga is at the foot of this mountain, so all we need to do is drive down. The good news is that the drive down involves driving through some of the most awesome Norwegian vistas that take one's breath away. It's Monday 17th of June and the lakes are still frozen, snow all around, and the camera can't get close to showing what we saw and experienced. It was a magical hour.
The road we travel stretches before us. It's about an hour's drive that included a number of photocalls, and the scenery was non-stop wow all the way. The DJI pocket helping me to get steady shots out the window. Mountain streams flow down the steep inclines. The hills striated by waterfall erosion. That's Dalsnipper Skywalk up there. We're halfway down. The whole trip down was a succession of beautiful views of mountains, waterfalls, lakes, and the fjord. One might ask where all the water is coming from. Has it been raining? The simple answer is that it's melted snow. The water cascading down the mountain is doing a dance of freedom. Having been frozen all winter, it now skips joyfully down the mountain, energized happy and free down to the fjord below. When we arrive above Gairanga, we just stop and gaze a while. Cruise ships reminding us that it's not a lake, it's an arm of the sea the open sea being 50 miles away, thus the attraction of cruising through the fjords, sailing through this natural paradise and getting a bird's eye view of it all. There's the historic Union Hotel below. Gairanga Fjord has long been the most famous of all the fjords. Here the cascading water has, over centuries of wear and tear, formed the Uvet, a channel through which the liberated water breaks forth violently. Meanwhile, Gunnar, the strongest man in Norway, bends a foot-thick steel post. 
He's a member of the notorious Scandinavian tribe, the Vandals, though he denied it. So we arrive and take a look at Gairanga. With a few thousand others. A very pretty town. A very enjoyable visit. Eidsdal, Balsdal, Gairanga, here we come. Guna lives in western Norway, and nowhere on this trip is very far from home. As a result, many of these places are very familiar to Guna, and are places that even I have visited several times, and that I would certainly want to visit again. This is the heart of the fjords, and Gairanger is one of the places where the arms of the sea touch the heart of Norway. In past times, enormous deep glaciers carved out these valleys and were so heavy they eroded the bottoms of the valleys far below sea level before melting, thus allowing the waters of the sea to penetrate the valleys, and thus the fjords were created. Beautiful love childs of that opportunist, the sea, The largest ocean-going liners pass this way and anchor where the glacier once entered. Fjords are very deep, so it's no problem to accommodate these ships. This platform gives us the opportunity to get a great view. That's the renowned Seven Sisters Waterfall. Our next destination is a fascinating cultural glimpse into Norwegian life in times past. We're traveling north and later into the mountains to a place called Hedalen, a mountain pasture farm that is still active today, passing Eidsdal and interesting scenery on the way. I have many films about the beautiful scenery of Norway, and some show fascinating cultural aspects of Norwegian life. I was thus looking forward to seeing the Herdal Setra. It was the largest communal goat pasture farm at one time and has been in continual activity since the 1700s. Nowadays, more than 300 goats enjoy the rich mountain pasture and also contribute by enriching the soil, if you see what I mean. A process that has stimulated a hugely diverse flora 
Some of the farmhouses here are available for rent, and visitors may spend the night here, eat breakfast in the mountains, and enjoy the solitude. Clearly the farmhouses are themselves historical monuments, and for people who've never been to Norway are a fascinating sight. Houses with trees growing on the roofs. And maybe goats for lawnmowers. But great protection against the winter cold. The highlight of the trip was an interview with Anna from Germany, who'd been working here and who was delightful. She explained how the favorite brown cheese is made. Um, once it has been yeah, cooking for a while and it has like pasteurized, then you can stop the process and start it again. But this is the pan where we produce the, br the brown cheese mainly and the caramels. It's a candy made from goat's milk. We start with around 30 liters of milk um, that we heat up. And then we actually have to take out the white cheese in order to get to the whey. The whey is this very liquid leftover yeah, yeah. from the white cheese, you know, so um, the whey is the main ingredient for the brown cheese then, and it's oh. even more valuable for the Norwegians than the white cheese. So um, when we took out the white cheese, we start on boiling this whey, um, and then um, the milk sugar that is left inside starts caramelizing from the heat. So that um, makes the mass become thicker and denser and um, also gives the brown color to it. Um, and once it's very thick and more like a porridge consistency, you can take it out and work it in this wooden trough over here. Yeah. 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 For maybe 15 to 20 minutes to make it a very smooth and homogeneous mass and yeah. also to cool it down because it has to cool down constantly, otherwise the milk sugar might crystallize again. And so what do they do with the curds then? Um, the curd, it's actually, we don't have the license to sell that white cheese because the license oh. is only for products that have been processed this way, like for the last hundreds of years. Um, uh. But the white cheese is not, it has very strict um, oh, yeah, wow. restrictions. This is where it stays just overnight. Um, and then the next morning you can open it up. It's Norwegian high tech, it's very simple. <laughs> right. And you have the fresh four kilo brunost, brown a, cheese. A block. Yeah, like a block. There's other forms as well, and um, there's also forms that have nice patterns. The cheese is available here. And that's a kettle I used for, for co making coffee. It's, 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 everybody had it. It's older, it bigger. The houses preserve what life was like when Guna was a child. He remembers it well. We then decided to take a close look at the WC. Interesting and welcome. Clearly loved and wholly useful. It's been a fascinating and enlightening visit to a meadow amidst the mountains. A spectacular location. So we leave her darling and head towards the legendary Troll Stegen via Nordal, taking the car ferry to Eisdal. It's a route we've traveled before along the banks of Storfjorden, 
to Valdel and then up to Trollstegen. Some beautiful scenery, passing snow-capped mountains and fast-flowing mountain streams. Majestic indeed. Clearly there's a massive waterfall in the ravine here. Right above us, another torrent cascades down the fjord. By the side of the road, wild lupins, imported last century, but unfortunately displace indigenous flora. We soon reach Valdal, where the mountain stream becomes a rushing river. Clearly glacial from the color of the water, it's melted snow. that over the years has cut a uve through which the river violently gushes. What is this, you might ask? Well, it's a salmon ladder up which the salmon can swim to reach their spawning grounds. The river now being impassable due to the hydroelectric station here. These ladders are numerous in Norway. This is the well-known Gudbrands Juve that is spectacular to behold. It's clear why the salmon need the ladder. Before the hydroelectric station was built, there was a slower channel through which the salmon could swim. There's a bridge here and walkways that enable visitors to get a good view. This is the view from the bridge. The power of the river was remarkable. So on we go, but within minutes we were stopping again to film the river. I clearly remember stopping here with my daughter Rachel. Brings back a memory.
as we ascend a glimmer of blue sky. In 15 minutes, the scenery was totally changed. We're in the mountains. Then the famed Trollstegen, the ladder of the trolls. But not to worry, they only appear at night and they're afraid of Guna. This was a friendly one. Getting late, 7.45. Some people don't like what the authorities have done here, but I feel it's a good thing, making the sites accessible to everyone and making it safe, whilst at the same time trying to blend in. This evening we're fortunate there's no cloud or mist blocking the views, although the sun has gone off to bed. In the distance is our next destination, on Dolzness. The waterfall here is amazing, descending hundreds of feet. The winding road, not so busy now. To stand here and take in the sight is a great experience. So down we go. And as we leave, a shot from below. Then as the evening sun sheds its last rays, we continue on to Andalsness. Though unfortunately in the rain. On arriving at the petrol station, we had the usual 10 krona hot dog before continuing to Andalsness to spend the night. Tomorrow I leave for Oslo and then back to England. Waking up in Odalsness on the shore of Romsdalfjorden. Guna finding an overnight stop in a delightful place, right on the edge of the fjord. A great place and a beautiful day. It's 7.13 in the morning and we're off to the railway station where I will bid farewell to Guna for another year and catch the early train to Oslo. Trains in Norway are superb. The staff on the trains friendly and helpful and the tickets can be booked online at vy.no. Seniors, regardless of nationality, half price. 
problemer med vantillförsel där så. Furthermore, they provide majestic views out of the window at no extra cost. We will go via Lillehammer, whose most famous resident was Gulliver. It takes five hours to Oslo main airport. And when I traveled, cost 90 US dollars. Seniors and children, 45. Students, 72. The first part of the journey was through the mountains, stopping at Bjorli, where I visited on my very first trip. Brought back memories. We were soon on the plains, and I managed to get some great cab shots. Enjoy the ride. It's not very often we can get shots like this. Here, I'm doing what I call videographic license that is taking a shot out of the back of the train reversing the footage and making it appear that i'm filming from the front of the train At this point, an amazing but tragic thing occurred. We were due to change trains at Lillehammer, but the train we were due to board was involved in an accident. It actually hit someone, and the train company immediately put all passengers in taxis to the airport. Extreme efficiency, I must say. We literally arrived an hour before the scheduled time. A fantastic trip. <laughs> 